Hello, biology students. This is Mr. Chemis. We're going to talk about Gregor Mendel today and what he figured out for genetics. He was a pretty smart guy. He figured this out hundreds of years ago before we even knew what was DNA or what um, held the genes. So he's a pretty smart guy, and um, I wish we could all figure that stuff out. If you notice behind me here, I am actually broadcasting from his garden, which was located in the uh, Austrian, Austro-Hungarian um, Empire, or the which was part of what was left from the, the Ottoman Empire, um, and um, before um, in the let's see what year in 1822, and today it's now in the Czech Republic, which has the cool city of Prague. If you're ever in Europe and you get to go see there, maybe you could detour a little bit and you could go actually visit the monastery where. Um, where Gregor, Gregor Mendel lived. All right, so if you wanna follow the notes below, there's, a, there's an embedded notes, and otherwise I will have it shared in the screen here too, um, if you would rather um, learn to follow along with that. Okay. I don't think that's right, okay. It, it was not highlighting correctly, let's try again. There we go. All right, so this would be, um, a family tree, and um, how would we possibly figure out um, the genetics for a family? We could look at hair color, we could look at eye color, or we could look at some more important things like genetic diseases, and um, how could we possibly predict what our offspring or our children would be like? How do we know where those genes or traits came from? Um, well, we could, we could start with a, a simple family tree here. We could look at brown versus blonde hair. We could look at curly versus straight. Um, we could look at, um, looks like maybe even Paul here is, is bald. We could look at male pattern baldness. That is a ge simple genetic trait as well. Um, and we could, we could actually figure these things out and make some predictions using Punnett squares. So your learning targets for today are explain the study of genetics, how does it work, um, and some of the history with Gregor Mendel, and um, how do we use that today with Punnett squares and pedigrees. Um, and then also we want to know the three conclusions that Gregor Mendel made when studying pea plants. Make sure you can do those by the end of the lecture. Um, if you want to take notes on this, you can take notes on your own. Or, um, there's also a CC below. If you want to fill in your CC as I go through, you could always pause or rewind or fast forward. All right. Um, and these are quiz questions that normally we would do in class. So let's do them together online. Garden pea plants are good subjects for genetic research. Hmm, what do you think? Uh, the correct answer would be true. And the reason is they grow quickly. They have a lot of simple dominant recessive traits that um, quite a few actually that, that are, you could figure out the patterns of inheritance. And that's exactly what Mendel did. He grew lots of them. He could control which peas bred with which peas. And he was able to then, um, figure out which which genes were dominant which was recessive so it's pretty um pretty good the other thing that we use for genetic research other organism that's pretty easy to use is uh, fruit flies they use these in the 1920s um they grow again very quickly they have quite a few simple dominant and recessive traits they also have some sex link traits which they start to figure out all right so let's go look at some other studies of inheritance or some of the patterns of genes um, I mean, this began thousands of years ago, or even fives or tens of thousands of years ago, when we started domesticating plants and animals. So this was for farming, and um, this was for growing crops. This was having like cows. Uh, which which cow would you want to breed? The one that can survive a drought. The one that produce, produces the most milk or the most meat. The one that doesn't eat a lot, but still gives you a lot of food. Um, the one that reproduces and grows quickly. Um, we can select, and we did as humans, we selected for these traits, we bred those animals and plants, um, and then um, we got the, the, the modern day version of those organisms. Um, in the 1700s, we started to make a little more progress. Uh, we thought that people were preformed in, inside of a sperm, which is shown here in this diagram. Does that look right to you? Um, this was totally wrong. So um, instead, we're going to look through the genetic material, which is found inside of the nucleus of every cell in the form of chromosomes and genes. 
All right, so here's another quiz question for you. What is the passing of traits from parents to offspring called? Offspring would be the, the children, okay? So that would be a vocab word for you. Um, and those traits, those, those characteristics, when we pass those on, that is the study of heredity. Okay? Or inheritance would be another similar word. So just a little background information is that parents only give half of their genetic material, half their chromosomes to their children. So they, this would mean you would get um, half of your DNA from mom, and you get the other half of your DNA from your dad, and you put that together and that's what you get. <clears throat> um, and that, that makes you. And that, that is a unique you, unless you're an um, identical twin. Okay. Um, humans DNA is arranged in a set of chromosomes, or 23 pairs of chromosomes. So half of those chromosomes you would get from your mom, another half you would get from dad, and you put them together and you get all 46. That would be a normal um, cell. Uh, all the cells in your body have that, except for sperms and eggs, which have, which have gone through a reduction division. Um, they get half of the chromosomes to pass on to the children. So an egg just has 23 single chromosomes in the same for a sperm cell. So you can see it as a diagram, um, what we just talked about, um, how you pass on the traits from your parents and the possible offsprings you could get um, for that one trait. And so this would be a, another way to track that pattern of inheritance. Um, you could do a Punnett square, you could do a chart like this, which is an unusual, or you could do a, a little family tree like this. All right, uh, let's talk about Men Mendel. Okay, Gregor Mendel, here's a picture of him. Here's some of the pea plants that he grew. He is known as the father of genetics. If they would have had the Nobel Prize for science back then, he would have got it. Um, he lived a little bit be about the same time as, um, as Charles Darwin, who was also at this time in the, in the 1800s. And he uh, really started to figure out science um, and especially genes. And because he figured out what a gene was um, and how it got passed on from parents to, to offspring, he is known as the father of genetics, really smart guy. Uh, basically, he started growing on peas. He grew lots of peas. And he started to notice that some of these traits could be traced from parent uh, to offspring and then their offspring um, the next gen generation as well. Uh, for example, in this diagram, you would have um, a tall and a short pea. So here would be the tall one, and here would be the short one. And there's no intermediate size plant, okay? If they all had the same soil and same water, you had some that were tall and then you had some that were short. And um, he actually found out that you could breed some to be always tall and you could breed some to be always short. And sometimes if you bred those together, you would still get all tall because tall is a dominant allele. It's a dominant trait. Um, so that was one of the, the main uh, traits that he looked at. There's some others down here and on, on farther slides that we'll look at too. Um, so why are garden peas considered to be a model system? I talked about this a little bit earlier. They grow quickly. They have simple dominant recessive traits, lots of them that we can trace. And um, the, uh, the, the third thing, pay attention, they can all, we can also control which pea plants uh, breed which with other ones. And so Mendel did this by controlling the parts of the flower. Uh, you can see a diagram of this in the book on page 309. Um, and he, he also used a paintbrush uh, to transfer some of that pollen between the plants that he wanted to breed. Very ingenious, um, very cool. And he could, he could figure that out. All right, another quiz question. Which the traits that are passed from one generation to the next are called uh, genes? Okay, the answer would be genes here. And um, the study of of that pattern of inheritance would be called heredity or um, genetics. All right, how about different forms of the same gene? Here's another keyword for you. Um, this would be alleles. So the alleles would be like a big T for tall, little T for short, a big P for purple flower, a little P for white flower. Those are different forms of the same gene. It would be their dominant recessive. We call those different forms alleles. All right, uh, Mendel experimented with true breeding pea plants. Ooh, there's more vocab. What does true breeding mean? This means that um, 
whatever color that you would have would always, um, whatever children you have would still be that same color of flower. Or if you had a tall plant that always produced tall plants as children, that would be called true breeding. Or similarly for short, it doesn't have to be dominant. Short plants would could also be true breeding if they were um, had two, two recessive alleles for short. All right, let's go through the three different conclusions that Mendel got from growing peas. They're gonna be highlighted here. And this was one of your learning objectives. Make sure you get this one. Uh, the first one is just genes. Okay, inheritance is determined by your genes, and we call we call that um, genetics. Number two, we have different forms of each gene. They could be tall and short. They could be purple or white. Be green or yellow. Smooth or constricted, etc. Um, and then the, a subcategory here would be the principle of dominance. Okay, one gene is always gonna be dominant, it's gonna hide or mask the other recessive trait of their gene. And it's called the principle of dominance. Um, here's a key chart from the book. This one's on page 310 at the bottom. Uh, it shows the key traits that, that Mendel had and which ones were dominant and which ones were recessive. We want you to be familiar with these. If you have to memorize them, no, but you should probably know um, tall is dominant to short, green peas are dominant to, green pea pods are dominant to yellow pea pods. You should be familiar with those. Or even what is a pea pod? All right, and then the third conclusion here is the law of segregation. This is the idea that the alleles are gonna separate from one another before they're passed on to the offspring. So you get your, half of your alleles are gonna come from mom and half from dad and these alleles will separate um, to form the sperms or eggs. And plants have sperms or eggs as well. The sperms would be inside the pollen grains and the eggs would be um, inside the ovule at the base of the flower. All right, here's a quiz question. Which of the following was not one of Mendel's conclusions? He figured out alleles, figured out dominance, figured out um, alleles is number four again, and um, inheritance for number five. He didn't. He didn't know about random fertilization as much, which we'll get to later. All right, so all this type of inheritance we've talked about is because of uh, sexual reproduction. So this is the form where you would get half of your genes from mom, half from dad, and then it works for pea plants, humans, dogs, um, and even some of the great apes there. All right, uh, last uh, learning objective here would be how do we get the genetic variation? Why, even in a big family of like 10, why does nobody have the same genes? Um, how about cousins? How come my cousins never have exactly the same genes? Or um, how about a, like acorn tree? It has thousands and thousands of acorns every year each one has a unique combination of genes. How do we get that genetic variation? How do we get those differences in our children, in our offspring? There's actually four different ways here. We have the law of segregation, which we talked about, the alleles are gonna segregate. Um, independent assortment. So this one is actually in uh, page 317. So you might have to go to the second section here that's not about Mendel. Um, crossing over. You know, we could see this a little bit later in the chapter. This one is seen on page 324. Um, basically, some of your maternal and paternal DNA, your stuff from mom and from dad, it's gonna exchange into unique combinations uh, during meiosis or um, sperm and egg formation. And then random fertilization. So there could be any combination of the unique sperm and the unique eggs uh, there's 70 trillion possible combinations for humans, which is kind of bananas. So let's look at each one of these. Here's the law of segregation. You saw this here with Mendel. The alleles are going to separate um, by themselves. So if you have two big T's, one is going to go to the left, one's going to go to the right. If you have a big T and a little T, one's going to go to the left and one's going to go to the right as we form our sperms or eggs. Um, and here you can see they're, they're tracked on the individual chromosomes. 
the chromosomes are going to hold the genes, not just one gene per chromosome. There's probably between 40 and 1,000 or 2,000 genes on each chromosome, depending on the size of the chromosome. Uh, number two, independent assortment. Okay, this one here was in uh, section two. So this is the idea that um, genes for different traits are going to segregate independently. Um, so most genes are going to travel independently of, of each other. Even if they're on the same chromosome, they're not going to be linked. Okay. There are a few special cases that you could learn about in college where the genes are linked, but most, most of the times they are not. All right, crossing over. So this would be where you would have different chromosomes lined up during meiosis and parts of the, the chromosome from, like let's say the blue part is from your dad and the red is from your mom. Parts of those chromosomes are gonna cross over and exchange um, and then they're gonna uh, separate out into different sperms or eggs. So this happens um, during the formation of sperms or eggs. And this is another way that we get genetic variation. Um, it's kind of random which pieces break off and move um, and split. We don't quite understand all of that, uh, but it does uh, randomize your genes a little bit. All right, and then the last random part here is, uh, here's a picture of uh, sperms on the eggs. Only one sperm is gonna be allowed inside of there, and which one is it? It's totally random as far as we know. And so that's another way that we could get a unique combination of genes in your offspring, um, which sperm is gonna fertilize which egg. Um, it's going to open up a lot of possibilities there. All right, this is the end of your, your uh, lecture here. Make sure you go back and check your, your CCs, your homework. Make sure you can explain the aims. Maybe you could talk to a family member um, or a pet. I know that it's always a good way to just talk it out. It's a good way to learn. Um, and make sure, look at the true-false questions. All right, well, this has been Mr. Chemis broadcasting from the modern day Czech Republic. And I hope you learned something about Gregor Mendel. Have a good weekend.